Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Madonna Wambu, and uh, I am an art expert. I am based out in New York, and um, I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be there in person, cause because this Saturday I think I'll be speaking at Michigan. I'll be also supporting the community there. And uh, today's talk will be about building high quality Android applications. So for those who don't know, I'm passionate about Android because of a few reasons. First of all, it was my first phone. And second of all, I had never seen something so marvelous as seeing the snake game on the Android application. So that is actually what made me gravitate towards mobile. So before mobile, I was developing as I was actually building inventory systems as a Java developer. And then I realized, actually, you can use that knowledge to build Android apps, you know, and that's how I, I ended up in Android apps. So you can also build for iOS, which is iPhone. I have both phones, which is because uh, I do testing on both phones. But today we'll be talking about steps you can take to build high quality Android applications. Now. I've done this talk before and I realized the audience was different. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk us through fast, like just what is the, um, like what is just the Android ecosystem? What, like just what is Android in general, the, like the mobile landscape for people who've not like touched any of Android, you know, cause I realized that not many people have done Android. So a good introduction of what Android is, also a little bit of background that would really help. So the mobile landscape is divided into two and we have the operating system, we have Android and iOS. So if you decide to build for Android, you're an Android engineer. If you decide to build iOS, you're, you're an iOS engineer. Now I have to mention, you can build for both through using Flutter. And I think we have a speaker, Romain, who builds using Flutter, and you can build natively. By natively, it means you specialize on just building specifically for Android and iOS, specifically for iOS. Now, uh, things, things that I like to mention just to showcase what these are. So in Android, we use Kotlin, which is the programming language called Kotlin. Before we used to use Java, as I mentioned earlier, my first knowledge was Java. So when I learned I can use this knowledge to build Android apps, I was so impressed. I was so impressed and so happy. However, over the years, of course, APIs and languages changed. So Google decided all Android engineers need to start using Kotlin. So that's what I use now. And that's what other developers use. However, I have to mention that you're not limited to start your application in Java if you want to. Uh, a lot of legacy code still is in Java. So if you want to start with Java, you're good at it, you can do it. It's pretty interesting because the history is the same for iOS. So when they started, they were using Objective-C and when excuse me, and when they, I mean, when they advanced, they started using Swift. Now, I'm going to stop a little bit here and just say a few advantages that I've seen for Kotlin. So Kotlin and Swift, they're pretty similar. And being an engineer that has built for both now, I feel like I've touched Android and I've also touched iOS, I can tell the code that I write for Swift and the code that I write for Kotlin, it's pretty similar. So if you want to look into those, you can definitely look into those in at your own time, but they're very, very similar. Now, when you decide to feel build for multi-platform, which is for both platforms, you can go either the route of Flutter or React Native. And now this Kotlin multi-platform. I didn't want to mention there because I, I don't know if it's stable yet. I've not checked the latest documentation, but that also can be used. Now, so if you're there at school and you're wondering what is actually Android or what is what are we talking about? So Android is developed by Google and Android is an open source platform. That's what makes Android win, if you ask me, because Android is used in so many devices. And if you've met an Android engineer, I know you'll meet one today, Saga. Hi, <laughs> I know you're there. And I, I saw your way, <laughs> pretty cool. So one thing that you'll notice is that Android engineers, we encounter pretty many problems, especially when you're trying to build for other, especially when we're building and why. Because you'll find that Android is used by Samsung, Motorola, Pixel. So we don't build for one specific device as iOS people build. You know, iOS, they only have one phone. So life for them is easy. But I feel like I love that challenge because from time to time, I'm like, uh, there's only one bug that's available for all the Note 5. How is that even possible? 
And then you start digging into how can you solve that and it leads to having a hack that you can solve. It's just funny, interesting things that we deal with as under developers. But I'm not meant to discourage you. I'm just meant to encourage you into looking at it in a different perspective. Where it's, it, it's fun if you enjoy solving problems. Now, uh, the IDE that we use, this is the reason why I added this slide is because I realized some student didn't know. How can I get started in Android? What is the IDE that I actually use? So the integrated development environment that you use when you want to build your first Android application is called the Android Studio. And then again, the official language would be Kotlin or you can use Java, but it's recommended that you use Kotlin. So don't say I said use Java, use Kotlin is the best recommended. And actually, I mean, Jetpack Compose, which is one of the latest UI, UI framework that Google just released and launched, which is pretty nice, recommends that you, I mean, it's entirely in Kotlin. So you find that you write your UI in Kotlin and also write your logic in Kotlin, which is pretty nice because I don't have to learn or have to start writing XML, which is, you know, it's a lot of work. Now, uh, for iOS, it's developed by, by Apple, sorry, and it's not open source. So you cannot find too much about what they're doing. So it's just closed in, in-house. But I have to mention a pain point that I experienced when I was developing for Android is that, especially with AR, AR, you find that iOS, since they only support one particular phone, they have advanced AR core, which is, they, they call it AR kit for iOS. So that was pretty tough for us to keep up with that. Like Android engineers were pretty finding it pretty tough to keep up with the way iOS people are releasing based on AR, like augmented reality stuff. Now, for iOS, if you want to build with it, you use something called Xcode. And then the official language there, again, is Swift. Or you can use Objective-C. But I also I would say don't go with Objective-C because I've heard people complain about it because Swift is more modern. I mean, you notice it's like they copied each other in a way. So... Yeah. Now, this is the hybrid. Uh, this is how I read up. Um, these are just icons for hybrid development with Flutter, Kotlin Multiplatform, and React Native. And I had a slide here just to talk about what Flutter does, what React Native is, and Kotlin Multiplatform, what that is. So after I'm done, I'll, sh I'll share this particular slide so that you can look into this. Now, when you're building high quality Android application, I know this is pretty tough. However, UI and UX design matters a lot, especially for the modern world. Why? You don't want to be the person that builds an app that has wonky UI. I mean, who's going to download that? First of all, people will rate it like two point something or even one, or you'll get bad feedback because right now all applications are modern. The UIs look so good. So for Android, it's recommended to follow the material design guide. And if you're building for iOS, you can look into that. So the reason why I wanted to add them is because I'm comparing the two and I just want to showcase. If you want to get started in either, even though at the end of the talk, it's all about Android, but just being fair on the side. So for iOS, they use the human interface guideline. And I mentioned this because it's very similar. I mean, I could not tell the difference from time to time. I think the only difference I could tell is maybe if they call their text, they don't call modifiers as we do, but they, they decorate them. They decorate their text and their buttons the same way we do in Jetpack Compose. And if you've not looked into it, it's going to be super cool. So I've mentioned so much, I've talked too much about Jetpack Compose. What is Jetpack Compose? So Jetpack Compose, as I mentioned before, is a new decorative way of doing UI in Android. And it moves away from the XML based layout, which is super cool. I mean, I can tell you how much, how many, I mean, how long I would just spend Googling, like how do you create a top bar for in XML? And then I would go get the code. It's not something that used to come at a flash. But now since you use the same language, which is Kotlin, it's much easier to get all these things that I go. And I feel like I've mentioned this before, but I feel like I'm able to flex now when I'm coding because I'm like, oh, okay, build this button, do this, do this, and it, it works as expected. And now, things that I also like to mention when you're building high quality Android applications is ensure that navigation is well handled. 
And there is more capabilities now using navigation with Jetpack Compose. And as you can see there, I just mentioned two points where you can look into how you can integrate this for your application. Why is navigation important? You might be wondering. It's because as a user, you want to make sure that if you're navigating from point a to point B, it's seamless. So if you build applications that have wonky navigation, I feel like as a user, normally I just background the app or even kill the app and you don't want that. And this is maybe you, you as building professionally or just you building as an indie developer. So ensuring that navigation is well handled is very important. Now, the next slide is going to have a lot of tech jargon, but the idea is to have you, if you're int interested in building high quality Android application, look into these words. I will not explain all of them at once, but I will explain why they are important because I think they're very important things to consider when you're building for the modern world. Now, something that I like to mention is state. And here you might be wondering, what is actually state? Now, think of state as, let's say for instance, you were open an app, and uh, you saw like name and then there was like enter, enter ID or you were just put in a, let's say a description of something. When you navigate away and come back to that app, what do you expect? If I was there in person, I would want somebody to raise their hand and answer that question. But you would expect when you come back, you'll find the things that you had entered. You don't have to retype them again. So ensuring that your app manages the state is very, very important because we wanna make sure that we're building reactive UI. And also by reactive UI, you wanna make sure that if you're building an app, let's say for instance, you're trying to think of, let's say an app that pulls from a data, you wanna make sure that once that data is populated from the back end, it's shown immediately on the phone. You don't want people waiting and waiting for the data to load and load and load because reactive UIs are a fundamental aspect of modern Android application, you know, steps to build apps that are way well received by the by the customers and also by people that use your apps. Now, I have to mention, I've also built for developers, which is building SDKs. If you decide to go through that route, which is building for other developers, which is building software development kits, because these are real jobs that you can actually work, work in, you don't have to worry about many of the things that I'm mentioning today because you don't deal with UI you deal with a lot of logic on what you're trying to solve or what you're trying to implement. For instance, I worked on an SDK that integrated AR into another app. Like it was two major apps used by very big major companies here in the United States. And the idea was we would give them this SDK and then they would call that and run in their app. So to me, I never worried about Jetpack Compose. I even never learned about Jetpack Compose. I even didn't worry about building quality Android apps. So that's just another part that I wanted to mention. If you decide to become like an SDK developer, it's also another chance. Also, I have to mention, you just build also with Kotlin because we wrote Kotlin, but we use a lot of um, reactive programming because you want to make sure that everything reacts as you want because we are maybe getting stuff from the server and we want it to be reactive immediately updated all that stuff now with compose if you decide to use compose so why am i saying this why am i telling you start with compose it's because i would not like it that a new developer right now you're wondering where do i start and then you're like oh there's xml should i spend time learning xml i think to be honest understanding the basics is good from time to time however i know i don't know if this is going to be controversial however i don't feel like it's really needed for new developers now to start learning xml no i think that would be a waste of time it would be good i mean if you want to spend time to just understand how it worked before that's good it's kudos but you can immediately just start with Compose because Jetpack Compose promotes the use of, let's say, mutable states, reducing errors, enhancing predictability and testability, which is things that you want right now on your application. And as I mentioned, it, I'm going to have a lot of tech jar jargon in this particular slide, but think of these things as things that you can look into when you're trying to build your application. Like what is scope state and composition? What is state hosting and data flow? What are these things used for? How can I use them? Because you'll see them a lot. These are words that you'll see them when you're building. Now immutable and immutability states benefits are like you get sculpt state and composition. Again, like I mentioned, it's gonna be a lot of tech jargon here, but stay with me. The idea is these words, you'll see them when you're developing using Jetpack Compose, but you can also 
I don't I learn is I mean the way I learn is that if I see a word I google it and I bookmark it just to read it if I encounter it again because I'll be like huh what is state and composition so a, a good example here is that start ca- like state can be defined like at different scopes that's allowing for modular and granular man- management and mostly when I think about let's say things like view more integration this is following the patterns are recommended now for Java Compose you can either use um, MVI or MVVM and if you're working in a more established application you might find that they're using model view model which is also take jargon if you've never heard about these words. So definitely look into that. So before all of this, like Jetpack Compose and Mildin for Modern Application, what we had was what was called MVC, which is Model View Controller, which I think even iOS got rid of it. I mean, yeah, I think iOS still recommends Model View Model. And also it helps with, um, I think, my previous slide, which was uh, immutability and immutable state we were able to do testing and debugging, which is very important. Now, let me slow down here a little bit. So most of the applications that you'll find that you'll work with, if it's not an application that you're employed to work on, you will find yourself most of the time fetching data from somewhere and displaying that data on the phone. I feel like that's what we mobile Android engineers do. Most of the time we're just fetching data and displaying that data on our views, but we have to build everything from scratch. So for fetching data, we use uh, rest of it. And I know now we have like stuff like Kotar and other great resources that you can use. So if you're new and you're trying to see how you can build high quality Android application, just look into what the community is recommending or using. And I have no preference on this one. However, I always go with what's more stable because it's much more to understand and there's more soft problems already. That's how I approach anything new that I do. Now, the same is that when you're applying recommended patterns, also look at why is MVI used? Why is MVVI, why is MVVM used? So things that you can actually look. And then finally, optimizing for performance is very, very important. You have to ensure that your app is well optimized for performance. And with Compose, you have a lot of power. You can use like Compose Dev Tools, Compose Profilers to just debug your code and understand if you're making any mistake when you're building your application and just making sure that you're in the right line when you're building your applications. And when you have a lot of loading, especially in your in your apps, for instance, here I'm thinking if you're trying to build an app that's like Twitter, you can utilize like list loading and pagination, things that are not offered with Jetpack Compose, which is super amazing. I mean, I can't believe the way I, I, I mean, I try to go back and start thinking of how I would start building like a like a column and which had less loading, it would, it would definitely take long. And then the other point just showcases like what you need to be aware of, what these are, and also just you learning about them. And then testing, testing is very important because I mean, you can build high quality Android applications without them being well tested, right? I mean, how do you test your code? This includes mobile, uh, sorry, this includes integrated tests and also UI tests. So, oh, sorry, unit tests and UI tests. Let me, let, let me use the layman terms. So UI test is when you're very fine. If a button is available, is it shown? If a button is clicked, what happens? Now, for the unit test, you might test bits of code that really needs verification. For instance, your view models or other logic that you might want to test in your, in like, isolated in units. Now, I feel like I've talked too much. I'm going to walk you through. I don't know. Do I have, do I have time? Am I, am I out of time? I wanted us to walk through just a little code just to showcase how we can code, but let me know if I have any time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So, what we're going to look at here is I've, to, I've spoken so much about building high quality Android application and how you can get started with that. But how does the code look like and how can we code this? Now, first of all, as I mentioned, you need an IDE and you need to ensure you have this particular dependencies added in your application or your integrated ID in your studio. And then after that, we are going to build a simple, so this is all pseudocode. You're going to build uh, a very well structured way to pull data. And here, as you can see, what we have is um, we have the main screen. And this is another. So, first of all, let me go slowly. 
So in this particular code, you'll see something called at composable. Now, this is an annotation provided by Jepa Compose, indicating that the following function is a composable function. Now, composable functions are like building blocks of the UI in Jepa Compose. They describe how the UI should look like based on the current state and data. And then when you look at what we have in the main screen, you'll notice that we are taking a list of items and then when we click, something happens. Remember when I mentioned about how tough it was before to just build a top bar? That is handled for us. Oh, sorry, that is handled for us through the scaffold. The scaffold has something that we call the top bar where we can declare the title equals item loop. And then you run this up, it will have an item list and you have your upper there. And then your content is where you put your content. For instance, in our content, it's an item list, which I'll show you how we create that. Now let's look at the item list. This is how the item list looks like. It's also a composable function that if you notice, we call a lazy column. So a lazy column will load as many items as we want, and then we are able to scroll through them in a list. Now, let's look at implementing navigation because this is something that I mentioned before. So navigation, I have a talk that I've done about navigation and different ways of navigating in Jepa Compose. So I will highly recommend if you want to look into how you can get started with that. I have it on my YouTube channel where you can you can see it. But here as you can see we create a sealed class, a sealed class screen. And what we're doing here is that the sealed class is a special kind of class in Kotlin that represents a restricted hierarchy in which subclasses are defined within the sealed class itself. And as you notice it just takes a parameter that's route and if you notice we just called object main and then object details and then once we call those where we want to use them we will navigate to the screens we want for instance the main will be the main screen and then if we want to click on the item details it will navigate to the item details screen that's how you think about it if you're visual if you're a visual person now so this is how the details screen will look like just a simple a scaffold that has item detail and then the content so here we just showcase it how we might display that. And the text, as I've told you, you just call the text and then pass everything you want. Now, I've not done a lot of details where I showed the modifier and whatnot, but this is an assignment that I give to you if you're really inspired and wanna go try this out. Just take these snippets and go try to see if you can make a working app, because it's very possible, I did that. Now, if you wanna handle any navigation events, it's, not so, it's also not very complicated, it's pretty straightforward. You can use the nav controller, which is provided this which is provided by Jetpack, which is pretty nice and also easy to use and learn. So what I'm just saying is there's so many ways of now building applications that are so well managed by the kind of tools that we have for the modern world. Now, this is how our get items uh, function looks like. And you see, it just returns a list of. So here I've just added pseudocode again, where I'm just showing it some demi data when we, when we get that. And then that is how the item looks like. If you notice back here, uh, the item just has an ID one and name item one. And if you go here, this is how our data class looks like, val ID and then name. And then in the main activity, what we'll have is we'll have that where we call our main screen, which was the first main screen that we created. And then we can do everything we want to. So when you get time, look into how you can complete that. And finally, to wrap up my talk, it's always continuous learning. So I might have spoken a lot about how you can build high quality modern applications, but it, it won't be as effective if you don't put it into practice or try to see how you can approach it in a different way where you would investigate how can I start even building Android applications. So it's always a continuous learning. And I have to mention that's it. I'm available to take any questions. <laughs> or you can connect with me here. Oh, and that's my book where I talk about uh, how you can build more than Android applications using Jetpack Compose. And you can connect with me here if you ever have any questions. I'm always available to answer questions. And that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me know if you need the slides and I'll be able to provide it. Please connect with me. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I always enjoy just bringing more people to Android. And 
any mobile development because we don't have many developers. I mean, I feel like we struggle a lot finding new talent. But yeah. Thank you.